Welcome, Christian, to the podcast. Uh, thanks for the uh, invite. Yeah, it's uh, it's great we get to to meet and I can and pick your brain for the next uh, little while. Cr- Christian is a functional uh, medical practitioner and is well known for his body transformation with actors uh, in preparing them for movie roles. Uh, famously, Christian has worked with several actors and stuntmen from the movie. Immortals and three three hundred. I, I pulled this off off the internet. So, can you just tell us uh, the story of how you first got your break as as someone who prepares actors and and stunt men to get into a phenomenal shape in short short amounts of time? Uh, okay, first, uh, it's you know I had this. Um, I'll answer your question, but yeah. uh, I had this interview with uh, an actress. And she got, she just got a big uh, gig on a movie. And now, out of a sudden, you know, they think uh, she wasn't doing anything. You know, she just get this, and now she's famous. Uh, but the thing is, she had twenty years in the background. So it's the same thing for me with the the yeah. in the movie industry. Meaning, I was doing. I've been in the industry now for twenty something years, twenty six years, and it's maybe eight, nine years that I'm in the movie industry. So I was doing a lot of things before that. Yeah. So fitness competitors or fitness uh, competition, I helped out a lot of uh, women. So this is where I learned my, most most of the transformation. But uh, I was preparing one uh, fitness competitor who was also a stunt performer. Uh, so then the stunt coordinator saw her, tra- saw the transformation while training her as a stunt. So then, it, okay, who's your trainer? And then from then it just, you know, you prepare one and the other and the other, and then yeah. the, the, and then you need to prepare uh, other actors or other contract. And as days goes by or contract goes by, then they get more difficult and difficult, and then you get. You know, if you have some good results, and you just call back. Yeah, and obviously in the beginning, you 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 were able to get that result for for that initial actor, and then I guess it it snowballs uh, from that. Yeah, but the, the the difficulty with the the in the movie industry is that there's a lot of money, and there's a lot of people that wants to be there or want to want to do it, but if you fail once you're screwed. Yeah. They just don't call back <laughs> because there's no, uh, there's no plan B. Yeah. So you have to do it and can you do it? Yes. Okay. And if you fail, then they just don't call back. Yeah. Even if you have a big background, if it's near, if you have, but I guess it's the, it's the same thing with top athletes. Meaning if you train, uh, less sprinters, and you train someone and you really fail for one Olympic, chances are you will change the, the, the trainer regardless of the background he has. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're obviously uh, talented Always enough to, on a tight rope. To, to get that, that result. Now, just how did you actually get that start? Though? Obviously, you, you, you started with uh, uh, fitness competitors. What sort of initially sparked your interest in body composition and who were those sort of early guys that that you modeled, modeled yourself after and looked up to? Uh, you mean for for training fitness competitors or just at the, my my career? Just your career. So from from the beginning, like what sort of initially sparked your interest, and and who who sort of got you into that, and then how you got sort of down that path of of body composition and transformations. First, I did it for myself. I think a lot of guys are doing the same thing, meaning they just try it, like it, and just, you know, just do it for others. Um, so I was very, very skinny. I'm not a big guy, but I was very, very skinny when I started training. And not when I was 14. I mean, when I was 18, 19, uh, at six feet, I was 130, 135. So very, very skinny. 
So I wanted to put mass on or muscle on. So Arnold was the big inspiration at that, that time. Lou Ferrigno, we were all looking at this and training at home with these you know, these springs, the, the bar with a big spring in it, and you were doing this, and every now and then you would hit the face with it because it slipped. <laughs> <laughs> so from then, it started in Gold's Gym uh, near uh, about two hours from Montreal and started to train. Training in the gym was a lot of bodybuilders in that era. So everyone was doing some type of competition or training very hard for either powerlifting or uh, bodybuilding. Um, so from then, you know, I was in the pool of bodybuilders. So you just you know, get um, a lot of information from it and then you learn from it and then you like it and then yeah. you move on and try your own things. Yeah. But who, who were the sort of early mentors that – took you away from just the the I guess the application of the bodybuilding sort of just the training but actually got you into the science and and the nutrition and then obviously supplementation and and the the, the level obviously that you're at now um what who were the well, early guys that sort of sparked that education okay it's the same thing meaning I studied by myself well I studied in uh, medical laboratory so biochemistry and all this and I continue to study uh, you know I finished school in, in 1995 so a while ago so then I just continue to study but the big influencer I would say I don't know 10 12 years ago was Charles Polican and um, I did a lot of interns as well with him, like one-on-one -on -one, to learn more or learn more quickly. So this, this has been a, a big influencer to study more in different fields. So he helped out, you know, you should study this, you should study that and learn more of this, this, uh, this part. So I continue like this. And then there are a bunch of guys that I followed for a, I don't know, um, uh, functional medicine, yeah. you know, it's like Rakowski, these guys yeah. for a while, and Mark Schaus, that uh, I still uh, talk to him uh, often. Yeah, yeah, oh, cool. So I've heard you talk about in previous interviews before, when you initially get a get a client, whether it's a, an actor or, or anyone else, you spend a lot of time digging deep and in the, the starting and to actually get to know them. Uh, can you just talk about that and why it's so critical for you to, to connect, I guess, emotionally, but understand them from a personality standpoint as well for results? For, okay. It, it depends on your, um, the way you view your business. I mean, it, it's not uh, that everyone should do it like this. It depends on your I don't know the, the format you're using, but for me, it's very, very important. Um, it just gives you so many clues the, um, that will help you build the plan to work with them. So the more information you get, the more you see where is the weakest link, and the more you work on the weakest link, the better the results or the faster the results. So sometimes it has nothing to do with um, diet, or nutrition or training and you can ask client I have uh, one interview and uh, the the um, stuntman is talking about that uh, our first consult where we say oh I thought we were talking about food and we didn't talk about food yet I was having results I'm like okay what's happening so the best comment I get from client is is when they tell me I don't know why I lose fat yeah this is very interesting. Yeah, and because you I like it when it's like because this is just otherwise they're not thinking only uh, about food or training, but it's something else. Yeah, and that that's because sometimes obviously if you're if the client sort of focused on the the analytics and the numbers that can obviously create some sort of psychological stress. Um, is, is that yeah. what what you're talking about there? Yeah, it, it, yeah. That's a, a big thing. I mean, 
that's for a regular regular um, client. Uh, of course, if you're doing fitness competition and all this, you know, there's you have a rules to follow and needs to be super precise and whatever. But I, I don't follow any clients now. It's been years since I've, it's just, uh, I've followed fitness competitors because I changed my my format or the way I view the the my job. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the more pressure you put on the client, you may get good results short term, but uh, long term, no way. Yeah, impossible. So you'll see super, superb before and after pictures, but when you see that client two months after, he's in a, it's like a mess. Yeah. yeah. So and I'm not big into the other part unless it's for a specific contract or a specific goal or specific and they they really know that that what will happen and what will happen after meaning you will gain back your weight as soon as you stop you will be there you will do you still want to do it well not really i prefer you know less drastic but a more sustainable way okay so let's go there so at least clients know you know everything that will happen yeah, and I've I've heard you uh, reference before uh, in a previous interview, uh, t- Tony Robbins quote about or a principle around people either respond better to avoiding pain, and respond or respond better to seeking pleasure. H- how do you yeah. apply this to your coaching style with someone? Uh, this actual prim- principle. Uh, I use it a lot. Uh, I think this this is one I could say. It, I never met uh, the guy. Well, I saw him in one conference, but I never talked to the guy. But I, I can say he's a big mentor because I did a lot of these uh, these courses or CDs. And, you know, you take a glimpse here and there that just connects with you. And this this thing about uh, uh, you need you do more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. Um, you see it in the way the client talks, how he wants to avoid things or how he wants to get somewhere. And if he wants to avoid things, I will change the way I talk to as this, have the same, uh, talking the same way as his brain is talking to himself, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because um, the example I give is, uh, let's say I have a client, uh, uh, he's telling me, um, okay, I have kids, I have a lot of weight, I don't want to die before my client, uh, sorry, uh, too early and leave my kids um, alone without a father, blah, blah. So it's all on the pain side. So I will press more on the pain side because it's not into, oh, I want to perform more. I want to, you know, all the positive side of losing weight. Even that, you know, I don't want to get a heart attack or I don't want to. So sometimes pushing on the pain, not in a mean way, that's very important, not the, yeah. to put people down, but pushing a bit on it, it's very helpful. Because then you know how to take them or how to uh, make them, uh, help them to be better or achieve their goals. Yeah, and then if someone's on the opposite end of the scale and they're, extrinsically sort of motivated by by results and they're focused on uh, the external then you'd coach them accordingly to to that exactly so it will be always goal setting and and all this because if you're in the pain side usually the goals uh, it's it's um, very vague in their head so I'm more driven to toward goals so for me, it makes sense to see the end line or to see where I'm going. But for them, they need to avoid something. So the road to this uh, trophy or the, the good thing, they don't see it quite well or it's not a big motivation for them. So it will be like 10%. Yeah, but it's far away. Yeah, but it's it will be in months. Yeah, but so they will give you all these yeah. answers. So I won't go there. Yeah. And obviously, obviously, yeah. this uh, you need some sort of element of trust for them to obviously 
divulge these answers to you. What, what's a sort of tip or, or trick that you get for people to entrust in, in you as a coach and, and what you're doing is, is going to get them to from point A to point B? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, in, it's intuitive for you. You, just, I guess, uh, you, know, you know what? Uh, one of my, uh, I'd say, psycho, uh, psych, uh, psychology coach, she was uh, always telling me you have two ears, one mouth, one mouth, so you listen more than you talk. So I think it, it comes back to listening a lot mm-hmm. and um, understanding what they're saying and not just hearing it. So, okay, what you're saying by this is this, or are you saying this, or what are you... Uh, one thing I use a lot is define. Uh, I had an intern, a guy from uh, Australia, and he wrote in his note, uh, define, define, define. Um but uh, the thing is, is that it's not my perception that it's important; it's theirs. So, okay, well, I want to need, uh, I want to lose uh, some weight. Okay, define some, because for me, some weight is just three pounds, but for him, some weight is hundred pounds. Yeah. And this then doesn't make sense for me. So, we need to talk the same language and make sure we talk the same language. So if I'm at the same level or I talk the same the same way or same word, then we connect. Yeah. That's easy. Again, it's the same thing with the, the pain and pleasure thing. So if I talk more about pain, we connect more than if I talk about pleasure. Yeah. For for that example I, I gave earlier. Yeah. And can you talk about just how how people's beliefs sometimes obviously it's the whole notion of placebo versus nocebo. Uh, that how it can affect someone's results. I've heard you say before that depending on if, if it's a woman and she's scared of of, of carbs and you, you can just pick that up from what she's saying, then you will come at a different approach. Could you just, uh, I guess, elaborate on that? Uh, what, what do you want to know? So, so if if you're, I'm not sure I understand well the question. If if you're in an interview with, uh, I guess, yep. someone you're asking, you're digging deep on on questions, and you you start to pick up a vibe that maybe just from what they've said via like a food recall that they're obviously eating predominantly fats, and you, you get the idea that they might be say cut like carbophobic, and then if you go in there yep. and start just giving them carb like carb cycling then they're going to have that in their head that it's you know they're going to get fat um i guess my question is do, do you change your approach uh based on on what someone's mindset might be around those cer- certain things yeah definitely i teach a lot in the office um i have boards whiteboards and i draw a lot and i explain a lot so I go I go through this, and I will take an hour to, so that they understand where the, the the glucose is going. That you'll do glycogen with it. What's glycogen? What's insulin resistance? What's all this? So there's no way you can make fat out of half a cup of rice. It's just impossible, especially if you train hard. Whatever, it's it's just impossible. So I will explain them, but first. I will ask them why they believe that. Yeah. Why do you think carbs are fattening? Well, everyone knows that. Who's everyone? Because I don't believe it. So, you know, so just, again, taking their perception. And then there's no explanation to it. There's no, uh, or they will say, well, I cut the carbs and then, uh, you know, I lost fat, uh, let's say two years ago I cut carbs and I lost fat so fat makes me happy uh, makes me fat okay do you, are you what are you talking when you're talking about fat uh, carbs yeah. is it cake is it I don't know crappy food or are you talking about rice are you to- talking about yams are you t- talking about sweet potatoes are you talking what are you talking about when you talk about carbs 
Yeah. And then I'm just rebuilding their the way they think about carbs because carbs don't equal carbs. Yeah. So after this discussion, then they know, okay, there's different types of carbs and different response to the body. Yeah. So then I re- the more you understand the physiology or the more, because for us, it makes sense because we've been reading about it for years or we've, you know, we've read out, you know, tons of books. So it makes total sense. But if someone is not into uh, as deep into their, their, their knowledge in, in that field, yeah. then they just know whatever they heard on TV or whatever they heard from their neighbors or you know, so that's what they have in mind. So as soon as you show them that it's not science based, yeah. Then, okay, so what is science based? Okay, this is how it goes. But we'll don't we won't go crazy about it. We'll start very low, like small quantity. Your body will adapt and everything will go well. And if it doesn't work, then we'll take it off. So I'll release the pressure. Yeah. Okay. And and just when, when you're working with uh, extreme cases, like if you've got two weeks to, to pack on as much muscle or to drop mm-hmm. as much body fat, where, where do you actually start with someone like that? Obviously, you go through, you do your, your needs analysis and you sit down with them and talk them yeah. through what, what, what the process is. But what, what would be the next step for you with, with those extreme cases? Uh, it's very, very, it depends on, uh, you know, as many clients or especially with actors or, or stunt performer I work with, I have different ways to do it with everyone. Yeah. It, it It's very, very specific, but the, the main thing is, um, um, well, it's okay. The history, I want to know as much as I can about what they tried in the past because it's a case study. So I need to know the stories. It's not about what I know, my knowledge. Yeah. It's about what they experienced. So you were talking about 300. I didn't work on 300, but I work with guys that are, uh, I've done it. Yeah. So I work with uh, guys that did uh, Immortals and 300 and shape was different uh, because I played it uh, a different way with them. Meaning, uh, okay, I was on 300, like Jason, uh, you'll see, I think it's in part two of the, the, the my interview series. Yeah. Um, he was taking, saying that um, in 300, I was a smaller version of me but not necessarily super lean. Whereas with you, it was more lean than just a smaller portion, a smaller version of me. Yeah. So then, okay, what was the diet you were on? Well, we were on the, on zone. Okay. So I won't go into the zone diet. Yeah. But if I had in my head that, okay, we need to do zone type of diet, you know, it's 30% uh, percent carbs, whatever. Yeah. Um, but um, so if I had in mind, I want to work like this with this guy before he comes in, I know what to do. And I didn't get the whole story. Then I know, OK, he was a smaller version of himself. So he was just losing the mass or whatever he was losing. Let's say a pound of, of fat for a pound of uh, muscle. So for him, it wasn't good. And. As I continue to talk to him, talk to him, like, oh, I feel good when I eat fat and I don't feel that much uh, tired. And okay, he's going to be on a high fat diet. Yeah. Like crazy high. And then I adjust every two days. For these guys, I saw them every two days. Yeah. And, and or you, every day if I can. With, with uh, measuring as well, you obviously use uh, skin folds, uh, calipers. And you, I've heard you, you yeah. take measurements uh, daily with these, with these guys. Um, yeah. I guess that's case by case dependent on the actual goals. What what can you see just in in that short period of time? Like a, a little oh, you see a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know if you you saw that or hear it, but I look at percentage vari- percentage variation per site. Yeah. Okay. So meaning if I measure the pack and it's four millimeters, and the next day is at three point six. 
I know there's a 10% loss, okay, on that particular site. So even if the skin fold is small, uh, I will see a difference with uh, the diet I've choose. Or, and I know if I do this type of diet, I will see this type of profile. And as soon as I see something moving more than the rest of it, meaning everything is like 3%, 5%, and I see a few of them at 7 or 8 9 10%, then I know I'm going the right way or the opposite way, so I'll change the diet or I'll change the way I quickly. So I'll see the tendency pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. And but that's amazing is, you can see it in such be, a short period. Sorry? It's amazing you can see it in such a short period and obviously those ratios uh, play a huge part in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you look at just the millimeters, it's very hard to see. Mm. Because if you see 0.4 millimeters, it doesn't make, you know, a big difference in your head. But if you see 10%, meaning 3.6 over 4.0, then visually or mentally, you can uh, see that there's a, dif- a major difference. Yeah. And so- Whereas it doesn't look uh, a lot when you pinch it. But you need to be very, very good with the pinching. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, t- that so takes as time. So take it, it's 3.6, 3.6, 3.6, 3.6, 3.6, 3.6. If you measure one's five, the other one three, and the other one seven, you you won't get anywhere. So you need to practice, 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 and practice. Yeah. <laughs> and with, with those ratios, would yeah. you – so obviously the classic uh, biosig – uh, the the different parts that you you store your your body fats would in, indicate I guess in in biosig and bioprint terms whether you're going to be someone who's going to be more beneficial to carbohydrates or you're going to be more of a fat type in terms of uh, changing that is, is would you do you still use those principles or are you more based on your own sort of ratios I guess now no my own ratios yeah. Uh, I would say when you start, it's a very good way to start with the, the biosig. Uh, but because when I learned biosig, I had already like, um, I don't know, 15 years or uh, more of uh, practice. So I already had a lot of practice before that. So I didn't want to change everything because I learned a new, a new technique. So I used it, but I just modified it uh, so it was more accurate for the way I work with clients. Yeah. So I'm not, uh, maybe some markers, but for short time, uh, fast uh, transformation, I don't use it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the story is much, much more important than whatever I see on the skin fold. Yeah. So what they used to do or what they did before, because they all come in, you know, I don't get, clients that are 14 years old with no experience usually they're in the twin they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s so and they've been in the industry for a while so they tried they met different trainers they met they've tried different type of diet well anyone any clients you see let's say their 40s they've tried somehow or at some point in their life a, a type of diet or training yeah so you need to learn and the way they talk about it as well. Yeah. So I was doing this uh, diet, but it was uh, seven meals a day. And after two weeks, I was fed up, but I did it for two months. And then I didn't want to do it anymore in my life. And like, so your first recommendation won't be to eat seven meals a day. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you need to meet the client where he is. And then, so okay, how about if we do three meals a day? Well, well, we can do this. Who says we can't? Yeah. We can stop there. Oh, I like that. Then they want to listen. What does he have to say? Okay, so then we continue from there. And then by the end of the, the, the discussion, they end up eating five meals a day. But yeah. <laughs> it's just meeting the, the, the clients where they are at to begin with. Yeah. And I guess that comes back to, so again, to, the to buy-in. Important. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, 
a, a colleague of mine, uh, Eloy, who actually introduced us, um, yep. he was actually one of my f- first podcast guests. He he's spoken to me f- before about, uh, or he uses um, some fat cycling with his, with his clients. Now I'm familiar myself with uh, with cycling people on on carbs for obviously manipulating body composition and and some of its benefits. Could could you? I, I guess he he told me he learnt it from you. Could could you? Just uh-huh. elaborate, like what? What would uh, who who would be the type of person that would benefit from, uh, like cycling someone on fats, and what what are the potential mechanisms? Uh, okay, it's a two part. Um, first thing, if they're very very afraid of carbs, I may use fat cycling. Uh, it's easier to put, you know, good fat. The, the it's easier to put in their head to eat avocado and nuts and oil and all this than to eat a bunch of rice or any carbs. Um, so again, the, the, the story behind the, 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 the whatever they did before is very important. And then typically, do you have a good example? Well, okay, first, when I do fat cycling, I never start with that. Yeah. Okay. Never, never, ever. <laughs> I start with a regular diet. So then I learn from them. Let's say I pinch them every week. So I learn from my client. I learn we did some modification in the diet, supplements, whatever. So I already see a pattern. Okay. We increased uh, fat for a while and looks like the numbers were better. Okay. It will be interesting to cycle a bit and increase a lot the, 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 the fat. And one thing that was very interesting, maybe two years ago, um, I was at, uh, you know, Eric Serrano yes. he was doing a conference yeah. and, uh, or a seminar. So I, I went there to attend it and he was talking about fat cycling. And usually I do four one and he's talking about, Oh, usually I go like three or four days and then I increase fat for one day. Like, Oh, he came up with the same, the same thing. The only difference that he was doing is lowering the protein on that day, which I wasn't doing. So now I'm doing it. I reduce the protein as well because it makes more sense. Honestly, I don't know why it works. Yeah, I just know it's working. Yeah, but it's the theory from uh, the the theory from Eric. Um, again, it's a theory. It's like the abundance of fat in the diet just urge the body to increase the enzymes to manage all this fat and then you take it off so then the body is just um, playing with this fat even more so it's like teaching the body that okay there's a huge amount of fat so increase the enzyme and then you lower the fat so it just uses continue to use the fat as the energy source yeah and it works well, but not for a long period of time. Yeah, and when, when you said, can do it for maybe two or three weeks, and after that, the body like he understands what's going on, and then it stops working. Yeah, and when when setting, I know this is obviously highly specific to to the client's results, but when setting the the protein requirements, are there, do you have like a set uh, variation or or established numbers? I know you've got set numbers for calories, but is there a set value you have for for protein as well? Uh, during the the, the, the variation? No, not, the, not, the... not necessarily. Like if you've if you've just got someone initially and you, you're starting them afresh, obviously it depends what they've said to you in the the what what's yeah. worked for them in the past. But is there like a baseline you'd set someone on? To start, I would say um, around one gram per pound uh, to one point five. That's that's uh, rare. Women, I will go point eight to one yeah. average. But if they're very stressed out and digestion is not good, I will reduce that protein. Yeah, and increase veggies. So I may go lower. And, uh, you know, one other, other thing uh, that I learned from uh, Eric Serrano is that he did a lot of tests and uh, or experiment, and he says that you can eat 60 grams of 
protein a day without changing the uh, 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 muscle profile, meaning you keep your muscle mass even as low as 60 grams a, a day. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. not for extended period of time and all this, but especially when they're stressed out, their digestive uh, tract or the way they digest is not super, super good. So the extra amount of uh, protein is not well managed. Yeah. So for me, I prefer going on the low side and increase later on. Yeah. And I may do protein cycling as well. Yeah. And is if if the, you're eating say 60 grams and you, you're in a calorie deficit, w- you'd still wouldn't lose muscle as as well. Okay. It's uh, always about uh, time. Yeah. Like if you do it. Because I, I, I really like to cycle. So, you know, if you don't eat for a day, you won't lose like five, ten, five pounds of muscle. Mm-hmm. Even if you just drink water, you lower your muscle weight, but you don't lose muscle mass because you're losing your glycogen and water in it. So it's technically muscle weight, but yeah. it's not muscle mass. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone who's doing the the, the 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 fasting, they would lose their muscle like crazy. Yeah, you know, every week and trying to build muscle, it's much more harder than than uh, losing it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I still have an, <laughs> uh, a fact about Eric Serrano, where he was saying, and I think it makes sense as well. If, if you eat too much protein for a long period of time. The body gets used to it, and he just uh, adjusts accordingly. Your body will adjust to your diet anyway. We we all know that. That's called plateaus. But th- the same thing happens if you eat what well, the ratio of protein is too high. So the body will think there's abundance of protein, so we'll start using it as the energy source because he's adapting to the whatever food you're taking. So if you're taking two grams per pound for, I don't know, two years, and then you drop your protein very fast, my guess would be that you would lose muscle mass rapidly. But for average clients or general population that they don't eat much protein, I don't think it makes a huge difference uh, on muscle mass if you lower your protein a lot for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, or you cycle it. Yeah, unless you're a very athlete uh, where muscle mass is very important in all this. Yeah, again, it's case case by case, but for general pop, I don't believe if you lower your protein for a while that you will lose muscle mass. Yeah, and what happen- I've never seen it. What happens if you had a, a client who was looking to put on muscle, so hypertrophy, and he, he's had a background of either fasting or low carbs. Would you, just for pure like hypertrophy, would you try and change that guy's diet around and, and move away from that? Or like you spoke about before, if it's worked in the past, um, but would you find more benefits in switching him from that diet? Do it for, for doing it fast or just... Yeah, doing it fast. If, if you had someone and, you know, you had three weeks and you had to put on you know, 10 pounds of muscle, um, would would you switch him from what he's eating? Well, I wouldn't put 10 pounds of muscle in three weeks. But um, it's short. <laughs> well, I wish I can. Yeah. Well, I mean, five pounds. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> um, the only thing we can do is to increase the, the glycogen in it and make it, makes it look bigger. So five pounds, could be could be uh, depending if uh, the, the the how they trained before you can do it, uh, but it's the look that's more important. Yeah. So if they look bigger for me, it, it's much uh, better than actually putting size on. So they need to look bigger on screen. That's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we just. You know, just changing the casting around will help out a lot. Who gain mu- yeah. looks like you you gain muscle. Put, put some but, skinny uh, guys next to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but seriously, exactly or shorter. Um, 
But uh, the thing is, to increase muscle in a short period of time, you need to do drastic things, like drastic. It, if they're taking, I don't know, uh, maybe 100 grams of fat a day, then I increase it to 300. I'll go crazy, and I want to know what's going what's going on. If it's a short period of time, I will, I will increase a lot. Like when I give my seminar, I always... Uh, uh, show the numbers. Well, I, I I will modify the diet. Let's say 800 or 1,000 calories per day uh, different, because I don't want to know how the body reacts to it. And if I just move from 100 or 200, I won't notice anything. I want to know if your body is going to take uh, do fat with it, or you don't see it. If you don't see it, chances are you will gain muscle mass. Yeah. Because you're that, and you're not putting, you're giving a lot of calories without gaining fat, so it has to go somewhere. Yeah. So you will be more prone to gain muscle mass. Yeah. If uh, that makes sense. Yeah. And what sort of? Uh, but it's a, a lot. The shorter you have, the the shorter frame you have, the more you need to do tests. Yeah. It's not. It's not about what I believe. It's not, what about I see. Yeah. And if I see after five days I'm going nowhere, I will change the other way around. Yeah. Because we don't have time to 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 test everything. And, and just touching on like from a, I know you're not. You obviously address the food and lifestyle is probably most important. But then, obviously, from a supplemental. Uh, standpoint if you've got those short periods of time where you've got to put pack on um, some muscle or you've got to change change the look of of them what what are your sort of supplement protocols and i guess it's case by case because everyone responds differently to different things and depending on their their blood markers but are there some yeah. general ones that you'd you'd use in your tool of tricks um uh. Yeah, it's it's very very case by case, um, but one thing, okay, the more. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's for body transformation or health reason, uh, the more I study curcumin, the more I like it, for different reasons. Even from for cancer. Um, I have a few clients that have uh, cancer, and I found out that when you pair it with some medication or um, chemo, it actually improves the chemotherapy by protecting the, the area around and switching the immune system into a different mode. And there's a lot of study on it, but um, it, it's all related. If you help out the immune system, if you lower inflammation, anyone that works with clients knows that if you reduce inflammation, everything will be better. So I will go into the extreme anti-inflammatory type of diet. So uh, things like uh, boswellia or uh, um, curcumin or... Uh, not too big on fish oil no. uh, for short term uh, because it can do the opposite. If you take too much uh, omega threes, it become it can become inflammatory. If the client is not uh, has not enough or is not able to manage or produce enough carnitine. So you will oxidize your fat pretty well, pretty fast in the bloodstream. And we've seen that uh, in the organic acid test, where they have high adipose or uh, suberate uh, level. So they're not actually good to um, manage the omega threes. So I'm not against omega threes, but fast change. Yeah, I want to play with things that I'm 100% sure they will do well on it. So carnitine, like, obviously, would be one number yeah. one pick, and curcumin will be my second yeah. 
Well, what, the, the, what type of l Uh If they don't get any uh, concentration issues or any type is good, if concentration is an issue or if I want to make sure, they, they, like for actors, they want to be able to learn their text and, uh, because they still, you know, they have work, work to do, mm-hmm. even though they have to lose fat. Uh, so I will use acetyl L carnitine. I, I really like it. Uh, I like glycocarn if uh, circulation is not good. They also, so they have tendency to uh, to get a lot of water retention or swelling. Or so I'll use glycocarn with because it helps us with um, mm-hmm. uh, blood flow as well. Because all carnitines are, are good for fat loss. Yeah. They're all good. So whatever you take, the extra thing you get from quarantine will help out with the uh, yeah. the client uh, issue. So whatever it is, I will adjust. So same thing with magnesium. Yeah. So, so if bowel movement is a problem, I'll go with titrate. And if they tend to have cramping or they not able to relax, I'll go with uh, glycinate. Uh, I don't know if they uh, tend to have heart issues. I'll go with magnesium orotate. So I'll always have the, the benefit of magnesium, but I will use the one specific to their yeah. own problem. And the more specific you are, the better you get, uh, the, be- the, the best results you get. Yeah. I've heard you talk about before in one of your previous interviews that uh, magnesium, I don't know whether your thoughts have changed on this, but using uh, when you, you've got extreme cases where you've got to drop body fat quickly, using uh, too much magnesium can affect uh, the rate of fat loss. And in the, inter- the other interview, you spoke about uh, using ZMA instead of uh, magnesium. Yeah, I, I like I like ZMA. Um, again, I don't know why. Uh, like the theory behind it. But from the experiment, uh, because I know there's this competition between, between zinc and magnesium in theory, in practice, I just it just works well. So I don't care about the theory behind it. Yeah. And my guess, I know people won't like me. <laughs> they will complain of that comment. But I know there's, in theory, a competition. But in practice, you can eat a banana and eat everything out of it or absorb everything out of it. So my guess is that if you have high concentration of magnesium and zinc, you will still be able to absorb pretty much uh, a big bunch of it anyway. Because yeah. the digestive tract is so long and, yeah. and you're only taking gra- milligrams of it. Yeah. So. And My I, guess is that you're absorbing this zinc anyway. Yeah, and I guess it comes back to that that point that you spoke we spoke about before. It comes down to results, and if you're measuring a client's every day, yeah. and you've got that variable where you've added magnesium in or you've added ZMA in, then if it's working, you, you'll stick with it. If it's not, then yeah, exactly. So it's not about theory is good. Like I will still read it, and but I will st- I will try it anyway. And if I get different results, then, you know, it's like uh, they show a study one day, it's good. Then two days after, it's not good anymore. But then you change all your practice for that one theory. (laughs) (laughs) So I really like to experiment. Yeah. And you got got to be in the trenches. Training is the same thing. The The more you practice, the more you train people, the more you go back to your basic things. Yeah. Same thing with supplement. We try different things and then this is the the next best one. This is the next best one. And then you go back to the one you were referring like 10 years ago that what is really working well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so moving into the trading, training side of things, uh, assuming your, yeah. your client has uh, their basics of nutrition down, their sleep and their lifestyle, what, what are some of the, the training methods and styles and, and tools you use uh, to get to get people, I guess, in shape, um, whether whether it's for movie or if it's just for a general pop. Um, 
Okay, rule number one is choosing something they like because otherwise motivation is a factor unless, again, it's short term, then you don't mind and you just do whatever you want. Uh, but I, I'm not against any type of training. If they can um, work out hard, I, I don't want any type of training. But if they ask me to build a training, I really like the uh, circuit type of training, uh, like GBC like yeah. type of training. So nonstop, uh, lower body, upper body. And I would say, uh, again, this is a, another thing that people will complain about it, but I'd say a CrossFit like, but a, cre a clean one. Yeah. You need well done, circuit type, very intent, uh, so people can relate, but not the, the crazy stuff like we see too many often in the videos or yeah. YouTube. But I'm not into the this competition to know who's right, who's wrong. I'm into the efficient side. Yeah. So if you can do this type of training where it's very intense and you don't get injured, uh, injured. You get good results, and and you like it. They go for it. I like Tabata. So for people that can't go in the gym, you know, ten second on, uh, twenty seconds on, ten second off, and rotate them. Again, it's a, it's all a circuit type training. Mm -hmm. so I really really like it. To begin with, with new clients, I will recommend some cardio. Even the steady state, uh, steady um, pace cardio for a while, few weeks. After that, it stops working. But it's good to start with. And again, it's a mentality thing. Uh, people believe it's very good. Uh, so they relax when they're doing it. So I don't mind. So not four hours, but maybe a 10, 20 minutes after. It's very good. And then we start some HIIT uh like in, in interval training and then we do i may go with circuit type and then introduce um interval in it so very um active type of training yeah and i've heard you talk about before you kind of just mentioned it then about the mental states when you're doing steady state cardio and not being in that that stressed yeah. can, can you just talk about that one and how that's important it's super important. Um, okay. Let's say uh, you close your eyes and you imagine that place where you're on the beach, no sound, just the, the slight uh, light wind. Um, it's sunny but not too hot. And you walk in a relaxed state and you're drinking this water. It's super good, just perfect temperature. So your body is already relaxing in that state, you know, cortisol won't go up because you're doing steady state, uh, steady pace cardio. A lot of, I, I had this discussion with a client maybe a month ago and he's a power lifter. So he's away from cardio, but he was wondering if it could help because, you know, he's just walking up the stairs and he would get tired. Um, so, so he, he was saying, maybe it will help with my recuperation in between sets. Like, yeah, maybe it would, it would be good, but I'm afraid that cortisol would, will go high. Okay. But cortisol will go high. You know, a lot of, um, uh, studies are made on, um, marathon runners and the extreme ones. I won't ask this guy to run 5K every day, you know, seven, day, seven days uh, a week. I'm talking about 20 minutes three times a week or two times a week just to improve a bit. So we're not in that range, not even close. We're mm -hmm. very far from it. And for him, it's good because he's just moving. You know, any sport will, will have these parts where they need to relax or active rest. 
But I see the, this cardio part as an active risk, not as a training or not as a, I don't know, intense fat loss process. Yeah. So it's a place where they can relax. It's a place, uh, like I have one uh, act, actress, this is where she studies her, her, her part or, or she reads her text because she gets more oxygen and she feels more relaxed when she reads it. And she's doing maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes, but it's a, low, a, slow, a slow pace. Yeah. It's bad if you're doing it on the treadmill, but if I tell you, go have a walk for 40 minutes, you know, oh yeah, that's good for me. But, <laughs> but if you're at the same state, why would it be different? Yeah. The state of mind is very important. But if you're stressed out and you're doing a lot of cardio, it will it won't be good. But it won't be good either if you're doing any type of training. Yeah. Being that state unless you're doing boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I guess it comes down to like when you see a lot of uh fitness competitors and they're getting ready for a bikini show or a bodybuilding show. The especially I've I've worked with a few bikini competitors before and they just get into this emotional uh super stressed state and a lot of times you know that last week before the competition the stress just sort of almost ruins what what they did look like say two weeks before yeah you have water retention and now they want to increase cardio so they do one hour in the morning one hour at night and then this is where you'll get the not the benefit of it yeah. The opposite. Yeah. Are, th- are there so, any? Again, no, it's it's only common sense. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Yeah. Are there any tricks uh, that you'd you'd use? Just say, if you had a fitness competitor or a bikini competitor, would you um, use you know alternative uh, like you know breathing? Would you get them to do diaphragmatic breaths? Would you recommend them to do whether it's yoga or something to de-stress? Are there any things that that you use yourself? Uh, uh, I don't use the, much myself. I do uh, meditate a bit, like the the Buddha style type of uh, where you see yourself being part of the environment. So it's very relax- relaxing. But any, um, I will negotiate with the client whatever he wants. But we'll talk about different techniques. Let's say breathing. Let's say uh, I, there's a lot of apps that are very good for re- relaxation mm-hmm. that will put you in the, the meditation mode or they, ta- they walk you through it um, that are very good. So if they like it, and I only, the trick uh, the trick is always ask for five minutes. Yeah. And they want to do more. Not asking for 20 and they do less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they will skip it. So I start with five, and then and next thing you know, the next the, the next week you see them. Well, I'm doing fifteen. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Because five, I'm just starting to get better. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let's do fifteen, and yeah. I'm where I want to go. But it's their proposition, not mine. Yeah. So I like that. I like the EM wave. You know that that thing, the small thing that will. Um, uh, you put it on the earlobe oh, yeah, and yeah. it measures yeah. the heart rate and then you follow the pattern on the machine with your breathing pattern. Yeah. Um, this is very helpful for someone that has very um, um, you know, that needs proof of everything. Yeah. You know, these people that want the, the theory behind it or the, the uh, the research behind it. So now they can see that they get better because it changed color when you relax. You know, it's like a green or a blue or red. When red, it's, it's, you're not in concordance. Yeah. Um, so you need to be in the, the green zone. So they see it, therefore they have a proof of it. Instead of just meditating, that doesn't do anything. Yeah. So depending on their how they think, I will use different uh, yeah. tools. Yeah. Well, that's that's obviously it's it's testament to you that you know you you listen to what what they're giving giving you the feedback and obviously you're yeah. you're mirroring them in a certain extent and then working on that that habit. And I like I like the one about 
just telling them to start really small. It's uh, something that that Tim Ferriss he he does with uh, flossing. He says just just tell yourself you're going to floss one tooth per day, and that's it. And then obviously you get the the floss in there. You floss one tooth. You're not going to pull it out. Yeah. It's you end up doing yeah. the rest of them. But it's it's just the art of actually getting getting that initial step. I've heard you you talk about before uh, how, how it's progressively getting harder and harder to to get people uh, leaner in terms of the generations yeah. and yeah. and how the bodybuilders back in the sixties and seventies and what they ate and they still got lean. Uh, c- can you yeah. perhaps speculate? I know, I know obviously it's hard to to fully say what it is, but what what do you think are the factors that affect people uh, now nowadays? Um, th- that would be a good subject to talk about with a lot of trainers. Uh, yeah. Pick the brain of everyone, or what they've seen. What they've seen, people at twenty years and over, so that they saw the the change in uh, physiology. Um, I don't know if you think gluten has changed so much that it will impair your your body. Then you will think it's that that thing but i think it's just a uh, combination of a lot of factors you know it's like autism it's not one cause but there's a lot of different causes add up together that creates the, the issue so my guess is the same thing like epigenetic uh, is a big factor um pollution the increase uh even the way the the food itself is different you know I was at the grocery and I was looking for uh, um, grapes that had seeds in them. Couldn't find any. Yeah. It's all seedless. So, yeah, so for me, it doesn't make sense. We're changing so they cannot reproduce, you know. Yeah. So we're taking food that can't reproduce. Therefore, it's not really alive or, or I don't know. I'm sure it changes something. I don't know if if it really changes something, but for me, you know, you all you have melons that don't have any seeds in them anymore. You don't they change tomatoes that they are hard as a tennis ball now. Where before we had all these uh, these ads with this special knife that were able to cut a tomato, but now you can take any knife; it will cut a tomato because they're so hard. <laughs> yeah. they won't splash anywhere it doesn't exist anymore so it, it surely uh, it surely is putting a stress on the body or the body is not adapting to that change in food the environment again environment stress level that is different uh, we all have our different level of stress like in the 30s uh, we can't say that there wasn't any stress because people were really stressed out mm-hmm. Um for different reasons. So we all have our type of stress, but it's a combination of stress and relaxed period. And now there's no relaxed period because when you're relaxing, you're on your phone reading a book while watching TV. (laughs) This is relaxed mode. It's not, you know, uh, being outside waiting and just being by the fire and just drinking water. Yeah. So there's the relaxed time is not. Yeah. And I know stress is a big, big factor for any trainers. Mm. Like clients are very stressed out. Everyone has problems with them, mm. meaning to get uh, the results in an easy way. Yeah. And would you say that any countries, because obviously you, you would do some consults online and you've, you've obviously dealt with a lot of different demographics. Are there anyone, any countries, I guess, or groups in particular that do really well and then on the other opposing side that, that don't do well in terms of uh, losing weight and perhaps nutrition? And uh, Are there any trends, I guess? Question. Hey? Are there any like trends that you've seen with particular? Maybe you've seen a couple of. Uh, I guess it's it's hard to say. You, you need a, a big sample size, but if you've had say you know five or six people from a different country that all presented with similar uh, types of results. Um, okay, like for um, UK, 
there's a lot of pollution there, so people are very intoxicated. So they will tend to do need to do a lot of detox, much more than, uh, let's say, Singapore. Yeah. Um, on average, Australians are uh, doing very, very good. But there's a big fitness mentality there as well. Like there was in California a few years ago, like very, very trendy, I guess. So it, it, it helps when everyone, not saying that everyone is doing it, but on average, the, the population that is training and or uh, trying to be healthy is more than, let's say, in Houston, Texas. So it, it surely helps with the peer pressure because everyone is doing it or more people are doing it. So it makes more sense to do it, to replicate. Yeah. Um, so they will tend to do better, I guess. Um, yeah, anywhere you need to show, you, you can show up your body 12 months a year. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, in Canada, after a year, you have a coat on and you have, so you're not showing any skin. Yeah. So... On winter, motivation is lower, but when the summer comes and anyone wants to train. Yeah. yeah. So having results in December is much more complicated than having results Yeah. in summer. Yeah. But obviously, Canada is a, a country with le- low low levels of pollution, so you'd have a good uh, food, food supply and, and water, clean water and stuff there. So you'd yeah. have less, less yeah. de- detoxing than, I, I guess countries like the uk yeah yeah uh, yeah or hong kong yeah uh so we're, we're starting to get to the end of the the interview now i just want to ask uh is, is there any sort of personal mistakes that that stand out and something pivotal that that you've learnt over the years but by, by i guess making mistakes i think obviously we all learn from them but is there anything specific that that you look back on now and think oh I wish I hadn't have done that or um, I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay. First, first thing I had in mind, because I, I talked to, uh, uh, you know, we have ATP labs here. Yeah. Uh, see, and the owner, Vincent, we were talking about old stuff that we were doing before. And when you look at your protocol, like supplement protocol, like what? <laughs> <laughs> The list was like this, so you need this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. Like, okay, we had, you know, results, but man, that was much too intense. Yeah. Like way too many supplements going everywhere. But like you're saying, we learn. <laughs> and then they feel bad or not as motivated uh, taking their supplements. But then when you look at the old protocols, like, yeah, I wouldn't follow this. Not a chance. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So um, first thing that comes to mind is that old protocols that were way too intense and not adapted to the client. Yeah, adapted to the knowledge we had at that time. Yeah, meaning people need magnesium. Let's give magnesium to everything, everyone. People need zinc. Let's give. You know, people need fish oil. People need this. People need. Okay, and then you end up giving fifteen supplements. And like okay, no, no chance it will work on something that's way too intense yeah so and it's not good for the client's wallet as well <laughs> yeah and what, what what advice would you give to to someone a coach who'd, who'd perhaps just just got into the industry and and was eager to to learn more and what what advice i guess would you give them in terms of you know to to get to not make the mistakes, I guess that that you were talking about with supplements, but but also to learn the basics. I really, really like internship. Like, you will learn. Okay, let's say I, I talk to you right now for uh, an hour or so. Uh, you learn few few things, and then you want to apply them. But we're always talking on the average. Okay. On average, I would do this. On average, I would do that. It's not specific. But when you, 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 if you talk to me on private and you talk to me about 
specific clients. Okay, I would do this instead of this because in the past I've done this and that. And this is where you learn you know, the mistakes. Yeah, it's much faster to have a mentor. You just change it. I have a few mentors. Yeah, like you go through them and you see tendency. Okay, you know what? Um, this one is, gives me good advice, but it's not my type of. Uh, it's not the way I want to work with my clients. Yeah. Let, let's say you want to do more clients and spend less time with them because you have a good turnover and you like it like this, not keeping your clients, but having more clients and running around. My technique won't be good for you because I spend too much time with my clients. So you learn a few things, but then, yeah, but for me, you know, after 10 minutes, you know, I don't like being with clients in the office more than 10 minutes. I get anxiety. I don't know. I prefer doing something else. Yeah. But you learn a few skills and then you, you, you take another mentor that will teach you in this type of, of, uh, of work. Yeah. So I'm not against any type of, and I'm not surely not saying that my technique is better than anyone. It's, it's, it's the opposite meaning. If, some things I say adapt to you, take it. If it's yeah. not, uh, leave it. And it doesn't make you a bad person. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It needs to fit your own personality. But the second thing is experiment, 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 experiment. <laughs> Try it. Yeah. Don't believe all the, the theory. Try it. Because like we were talking, in UK, they need to detox a lot. So you may end up learning from this guy. They say, okay, detox, 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 detox. And maybe in your area, it's not that big of a deal. You need to detox twice a year and it's all, it's plenty. So you will end up doing this and then you don't see results. Yes, but he told me it was good, so I will continue. Yeah, but you don't see results or so just change. Don't be afraid to change. But don't change any time you, you see someone or you do another seminar or another course or you read another book. Don't change everything. Just yeah. try it here and there. See if it connects with you and just yeah. leave it if it doesn't. And, and you obviously do uh, internships as, as well. Yeah. And how, yeah. Do, pe- how do people get involved uh, in, in, say, your internship? Is it just through Facebook or through your website? Yeah, my website or uh, through uh, Facebook. And we just, uh, whatever their needs are, I will adapt the, the how we go through the week or uh, the type of clients we see and things like that or the schedule I put on. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. specific to the, the client. And usually I get the, a specialist of some sort. Like if you like manual therapy, I'll have. I'll, Someone is very good. I will come for um, half a day or a whole day to help out in this area. So you learn both different different type of um, information. Yeah, and yeah, you, you obviously f- find that uh, the the people and the clients that work with you, their retention and and application and knowledge would grow quicker than than say doing uh, your your standard sort of courses. Uh, just I guess that exposure. Would, would create a little bit more, I guess, retention? Do you mean retention of? Oh, just, just the information and the, the obviously they're spending an immersive uh, week interning yep. with you as opposed yep. to, to doing, say, just a nutrition course for a weekend yep. or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I like, uh, not to sell my, my seminar, but I like them to follow the seminar first just so we don't cover go there again and we cover what they would learn anyway in a seminar and then from then they've tried a few things that they learned let's say like uh, Eloy he was he works with the, the, the uh, fat uh, cycling then he will have questions about okay I've tried the technique and then okay see I tried it with this client that we're just see uh, we'll, we'll see uh, this afternoon You'll see the results and how I adjust it, by the way. So it's more the practical side is better if you have the, the, the like the theory, a bit of the theory behind it. Otherwise, I need I will teach it anyway. Yeah. But it's yeah, it's better when you have a bit of experience with all this. Yeah. 
So just just touching on your your p- personal traits and what what you do on a daily basis, can can you just uh, just give us a bit of a snapshot on what what your day and and your week looks like and and how often you you study actually yourself? Uh, okay, nowadays uh, I do clinic only two days and a half per week. Um, it's full. Okay. When I do a day, it's 12 clients. Uh, so I still see a lot of clients, but uh, two and a half days. Uh, so Tuesday and Thursday is my full days, and Wednesday is half a day. Friday and Monday is my study day, um, study days. For I, This is where I work on elemental. So anything I need to read, anything I need to interview like this, or work on my interview series, like I do all the editing, it takes a lot of time, or maybe doing interviews, um, this is where I'll work, because otherwise I I would only study after work, and then you're you're tired and you don't learn as much, and since I want to teach, I need to really understand what I'm reading, so I study what I read. I'm not reading. Yeah. So I'm a very, very slow reader. Like, you know, um, I, I won't say I'm dyslexic, but I'm not. I'm very not good at reading. So my reading skill is very low. Never, I've never been able to uh, improve it. Uh, for me, it's not a, a problem. I take more time to read, mm. <laughs> but I study more since I don't read mu- fast. I will study it instead of just reading it. Mm -hmm. So if I read only 10 pages in half a day, then I study these pages. I know that I have a good memory. So, (laughs) but I, I will study it. Meaning if they're talking about a study, I will look into the study and read the study or walk through the study. This is how I work. And in the morning, usually I will read, um, like every day I will read maybe 20 minutes just quickly yeah. on few things uh, I, I, I want to do. And on Friday, it's my planning. Like uh, in half an hour, it's my planning. Yeah. I never change it. So I plan my next week, meaning what I have to do for when I want to study, when I want to read, when I want to prepare, when I want so anyone that is a bit successful it's always planning. Yeah. So you put aside what's not good. You put in what what it is. So planning yeah. is very very important. In my schedule. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's some good advice. Now, I've just got a, a final set, set of uh, questions. Some rapid fire questions. And the first one is: what What is your all time favorite training book? Can be training or nutrition or self help. But is there anything that's that sort of, I guess, either started started the journey for you, or something that that you think about when when I say your favorite book. Uh, I have so many. Okay, the first one is not from from anything related to training, but it's uh, a book that uh, Einstein wrote in the nineteen thirty the thirties. That yeah, around that anyway. So it has nothing to do because I I, I like uh, the, the science a lot. Uh, I have so many of them. What okay lately the I would say lately the best one I read. When you read a book, whatever wherever you are in your life, sometimes you read it and it makes a lot of sense for you, or you start reading it, then it makes sense, and then you start reading it again two years after, it makes sense like crazy. Mm. It's uh, this book here. It's screw it, let's do it. Yeah. So, yeah it's Richard it, Branson. From Richard Branson. It's an easy read, but for me, it was a um, game changer, I would say, in the vision of the definition of fun in the job. I really like my job, but he always put a lot of fun into everything fun into family, fun into spirituality, fun into activities so i have a lot of fun into business 
but how to improve everything else uh, for me was a a very very good uh, good read uh, uh, good calories bad calories was a very good um, read as well a few years ago yeah uh, Gary Tubbs if if a client has no knowledge about carbs and uh, fat and or, or is afraid of fat I just make them or say or saying well they they were saying uh, fat uh, is good and then it wasn't good and then carbs are good it's not good so just okay if you want to read it's a big book yeah if you want to read something read that and then you learn a bit of history of the food yeah not necessarily that what's good or bad but the history of it, it brings you uh, into consideration how the industry works yeah so I would say right off the bat quickly it would be three books um, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good answer. They're some excellent books. Now, the next one is uh, favorite movie. <laughs> uh, can can, can movie be a movie that, that you got someone... Uh, the Last King of Scotland. Okay. I haven't seen that. It's uh, uh, me and name. Uh, what's the name of the... Anyway, if you see The Last King of Scotland... Yeah. It's a, it's a movie that wasn't very popular. You see, the actors are very uh, popular in it. It's the story of Uganda, the prime minister. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. It, it, and the acting is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that would be my. It's not action. It's not. It's a good movie. Yeah. I'll I'll have to have to look that one up. I haven't haven't watched it. Do do you have any uh, quotes that you say on a daily basis or you live your life by? Um, okay, one thing. Okay, uh, friends that really know me, they will always um, define this quote for me, I guess, is that there's always um, two sides of a story and I choose the positive one. Yeah. But always. Yeah. It's just, uh, I've been like this since um, I was young. Yeah. Uh, I had my issues, health issues, and I'm always looking at the, I don't say blindlessly, but I always choose to Okay, what I learned from this health issue is this and that. Since then, I've been doing this and that. I always take the. Yeah. I just choose to take the good side of it. Yeah, that's that's a great answer. What is your favorite cheat meal, if you have one? I have a lot of good <laughs> cheat meals. <laughs> I I'm a foodie, so I like I like good restaurants and I like good good food. Wow. Okay, I can't have any gluten uh, for health reasons, not for because I believe gluten is not is bad. So anything that is gluten free is very good. Yeah. Um, okay. Rapidly, I'd say Italian gluten free food. Yeah. Would be my first pick. Okay. Gluten free pizza is quite good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and f- final question is uh, if, if you could give your 18 year old self advice whether it's about <laughs> life or training or not not to give too many supplements to your clients what, what would uh, advice would you give yourself it's funny because I always ask this question to uh, all my guests um now I get it. Uh, uh, for <laughs> training, okay. Uh, I will need to explain it, but follow your gut. Yeah. Follow your gut. Don't overthink. Follow your gut. Usually, but you, okay. The, the thing is, if you want to follow your gut, you need some experience. Because it's easy to talk yourself into a way of doing things. When in your gut, you know that you shouldn't go there or you should go there. 
yeah, but you know, I've been doing this for five years, so maybe this is better. And your gut is saying, do yeah. The, the, the more experienced or the more you read or the more you study, the more you need to rely on your instinct. Yeah. Yeah. That's some great advice. Uh, just just finally, uh, just what, what's in store for the next 12 months and what, uh, where, where can people get in contact and find out more about what you're doing? Okay. Right now, I'm redoing all my, my website uh, again to include more videos and more things like that. So I'm doing a, a video series. Um, it's a new concept I, I, I have in mind because I've been looking for a way to teach, I'll say it like this, in a, a, a different way. So I'll do it in an interview form, but with clients. Like I have one online. The first one, part one, is online right now with Jason Cavalier. Who's a stunt performer? He's been on uh, 100, over 100 movies. Um, so the first 20 minutes, I ask them questions, or we talk about their career or goals or whatever. And then the second part, they are asking questions to me about health. So we decide if we talk about gluten, soy, uh, supplements, anything related to to training or nutrition or health. So it's a way to learn. So I work a lot on these. Uh, on these. Um, if you haven't have a look at it, I think you'll like it. Yeah, I watched um, it just before I came on. I watched the interview. It was uh, it was quite funny. He's uh, <laughs> he's, he's a bit of a character. Yeah, yeah he's so, Jason is so funny. And the next one is, is uh, an actress, uh, Kim from uh, Kimberly from Toronto, and I have a stand-up comedian after. So I have uh, a lot of uh, them lined up. Yep. So I think it would be interesting. So I work a lot on these. I'm working on my level, I would say level three for elemental, but it's not level three, it's level two B <laughs> because the, you need to do level one uh, because it covers everything. And then I have lab a- analysis. But the, the second one, you don't have to do the lab analysis. You can do just the second one. It will be uh, two days on sleep and stress for clients because uh, the knowledge of sleep uh, what we think of sleep, I think it's not accurate. So, um, like the notion of deep sleep and REM sleep and light sleep, when you should be more into light sleep than deep sleep. So I'll explain that. Uh, and yeah. and um, it's research based, and it's not uh, something I, I I I think it's something I learned. Uh, so yeah, so working a lot of these in my seminars, uh, I had to push all my seminars at the end of the year this year. So they should start all in September, September, October, November. Uh, so I'll do it. I'll go in Europe and I'll go in Australia for sure and Canada for sure. So it should be online. Yeah. I don't know, maximum in the month. Uh, well, the new website will be on and, um, with yeah. all the details. Okay, cool. And, and the best uh, place to people to get in contact with you, I'll, I'll link it to in the, the show notes, but is it your website or through uh, Facebook? Uh, either way, either uh, I have my, my personal page, people can contact me there, no problem. Or my uh, professional page, it's uh, Christian Maurice Elemental. Yeah. Or my website. But right now it's not, we're March 23rd right now. <laughs> So, figure a few weeks from now it will be uh, online in the new version. It will be, there's a newsletter as well yeah. that will uh, be there for more information and yeah. so it's easy to reach. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your, for your time. You've been generous and uh, very very insightful. Of uh, picked up a few few things just just from this chat, and I'm sure that the listeners will uh, will appreciate. Your, your time and uh, and your knowledge as well. Well, thanks so much. 